you're in a much more powerful position than you may think you are. Everything that we have created up until this point has got you to where you are, and it will continue to be a foundation to help you to move forward. Welcome to Get Unstuck and On Target, the weekly podcast that offers senior leaders insights and strategies to not only lead with confidence and vision, but also to achieve groundbreaking results. I'm your host, Mike O'Neill. I coach top-level executives on the power of ethical leadership to forge teams to be as united as they are effective. In each episode, join me for insightful conversations with leaders just like you, providing practical advice to help you get unstuck and propel you and your company forward. Let's get started. Joining me is Michelle Nedelec. Michelle is an author, a podcaster, and the founder of Awareness Strategies. That's a digital marketing firm that specializes in affiliate marketing and business automation. Michelle has run her own series of companies since 1995, and since 2003, she's been helping sales reps, entrepreneurs, and executives to continually double their profits and revenues. Based on my conversations with her, I can assure you, she not only has what it takes to help her clients build multi-million dollar businesses, she's done it time and time again. Welcome, Michelle. Oh, thank you for having me. I'm excited to be here. You know, Michelle, I introduced you as a author and a podcaster. What I failed to mention is that you're not just a run-of-the-mill podcaster. You actually, I think you host more than one podcast, do you not? <laughs> yes, I do. I actually run five of them. Five oh, of my. my. <laughs> yes. I am a special kind of crazy, I like to say. <laughs> well, let's start with there. What is it about running five podcasts that helps you uh, get better at what you do and helps your clients? How does that tie together? Well, what we found in the last few years in particular is that podcasts allow for businesses to be able to educate their clients, especially if they have a long sales cycle, mm -hmm. uh, one that requires some education, to be able to get in front of their audience for oftentimes, you know, half an hour at a time, some cases an hour and a half at a time, when they're being able to speak about issues that affect their ideal clientele. And what we're looking at is helping businesses to actually streamline their marketing efforts. Because a lot of, especially kind of Gen X and baby boomers, had a real issue with how do I do social media? How much, you know, be vulnerable? What does that really mean? Do I really want to be in front of people? And, and they're noticing that the owner of the business or the voice of the company should really be out in the public and give the company a personality. And how do they do that without being too vulnerable, exposing too much information, and not wasting a ton of time commenting on cat pictures? It's like, okay, we've done this and you know we've put them out. It didn't work. It's because the strategy wasn't there on top of the tactic. They're putting tactics in front of strategy and when you really understand how you, people buy now, then you realize that podcasting is the way to streamline your marketing efforts, to be able to maximize all of your people's output and minimize the amount of effort that you're putting into it. You, know, you mentioned how people buy now. How has that changed in the time you've been doing this? <laughs> Drastically. So for those of you listening, if you're familiar with the once upon a times of it, you either sat and watched commercials and went, ooh, that looks delicious. I think I want that. But then you have to get up and go and either walk half an hour, <laughs> go get something, or you get in your car, you leave, you come back. It, it was, it's kind of a ridiculous way of buying things, but there was a lot of um, advertising through television was the biggest kind of uh, the nirvana of marketing, if you will. Magazines were on top of it. And that's how you got to educate your clients was through magazines, especially if they were high-end clientele. It was usually while they were on flights to places. Now, if you think about it, if you went to buy a car right now, you wouldn't go watch TV and look at car videos. <laughs> you wouldn't go and look no. in magazines. You, you'd go directly to the Google and and you'd start searching on the aspects of a vehicle that you wanted if you didn't have the car in mind. And even if you did have a car in mind, if the 
features that you're looking for. If you don't go straight in and you say, hey, I want a um, BMW. Say you wanted a, a sports car that allowed you to you know, take the kids to the sporting events and looked classy. So you type that in, right? You're getting, you're looking at, okay, maybe BMW comes up, but then there's these other vehicles that also have those features that you're looking for. And then you start to do cross promotions, analysis, comparisons. Some people might be looking at comparisons of the type of tires and and what they look like. Others might be doing, you know, what are the engine sizes and what are you know, resale values, things like that. But we're doing a ton of research on whatever aspects of the thing that we want bef- long before we go into, you know, calling somebody or certainly booking an appointment saying, hey, I was thinking about a car. What do your cars do? And can I take my kid to sporting events? Of course, they're going to say yes. Right. So we don't do that anymore. And it doesn't matter what we're buying. We're not wasting our time talking to people about things that we're not informed of. We are making sales decisions and we're reinforcing those conversations saying, hey, I saw this. Is this true? Is this really what I'm going to get? And and the conversations are much more implicit while we're talking to salespeople than they have ever been. You're making a good point. As I step back and look, why would I start a podcast? And um, I started the podcast on the front end of the pandemic. And that is, we were all scrambling. What are we going to do? And therefore, I was just trying to assemble people who are, quote, in the know to share information. I found that I learned greatly from my podcast guest. Uh, I've already had this conversation with you prior. I learned a lot before we even hit the record button. Uh, So I get a lot out of hosting a podcast. But here's what I'm learning. Clients say, you know what, Mike, before I reached out to you, I actually watched a couple of your podcasts. And I said, well, tell me more about that. And he said, well, I wanted to just kind of see how how you work, how you operate. And as I reflect on that, what I realize is what you see is what you get with me. The way you and I are talking is not too dissimilar to what you and I would be doing if we were in a coaching session. I'm trying to learn about you, the challenges you have, and explore in what ways I perhaps could be helpful. But usually the answers reside within the client. Now, that justifies me continuing doing the podcast. That is, I'm learning from my clients and I'm finding that potential clients get to learn from me over time because they learn about me, not so much by what I say, but the questions I ask. So I just added pressure. I've got to ask you really good, insightful questions to <laughs> justify what I just said there. Yeah, exactly. But it it also... It also can be effortless in that we aren't just having a conversation and people are getting to know you. How do you listen? How do you respond to things? Where do you find the insight? And it can be in the obvious, which is great because you're going, oh, okay, you noticed that I didn't, good on you. Or, wow, I never would have got that out of that conversation. That's fantastic. And whether your prospective clients are the guests that are talking to you and they're going, wow, like this was a great conversation. I want to pursue it. I want to, how do I keep you in my life? Or if it's the observers that are listening to the podcast after it's been published, getting an an idea of who you are and how you do business and the types of conversations you have, the types of guests that you're bringing on, all of those things say a lot about you, who your network is, uh, speaks volumes. You know, Michelle, I'm looking at your backdrop. For those who are listening, you don't have the benefit of what's over your shoulder. But let me just ask this question for those who are watching on YouTube. um, You have in one corner, streamline your marketing through podcasts. And then over the other shoulder, you have a QR code of some sort, uh, which is brilliant. I had not seen that before. What is that intended to do? People literally pick up their phone and shoot the QR code. And if they do, what do they get? They'll go to the registration registration page for streamlining your marketing through podcasts. Hmm. So it kind of looks like a clock. Some people notice it and some people don't, or a piece of artwork sitting <laughs> and it just happens to be a QR code and just happens to go to the the events that we're promoting to be able to, if you're interested, kind of find out more about me. You know, I asked you earlier about yeah. how much things have changed. You said they've changed dramatically, but you also mentioned that it depends on what group you're talking about. Let's go there for a moment, if you don't mind. And that is, um, I know you work with companies at all stages 
But when you're working with a company, maybe you're working with the founder or the owner of the company. And in keeping with the theme of this podcast, getting stuck, one of the things you and I talked about is you introduced something that I guess I didn't think about. And that is, what about those people who have been successful, so successful that they garners interest, they actually sell their business, then what? Would that be an example of where maybe your clients got stuck? Oh, absolutely. And I think it's fascinating. The whole concept of getting stuck is fascinating to me because because we're human, we get stuck. <laughs> it's just, just not going to not happen. Uh, you can talk to anybody at any stage of life, and and it, it is a reoccurring theme. And the question becomes, you know, why am I here, and what benefit is is it to me? How do I get out? And I think the important part is what be, what is the benefit to me? Because if you don't ask that question in between, why am I here, and how do I get out? You fall into a victim role. And I think it's really important to understand that being stuck is not a victim role. Being stuck is a a distinction of intelligence in my mind is that you're smart enough to know that <laughs> what you're doing right now isn't getting you where you want to go and where you are isn't where you necessarily want to be, which is great because there's a lot of people on the planet that aren't where they want to be and they don't notice and they don't care. So if you're at the point where you notice that you're stuck and, and you're not where you want to be, then the question is, what benefit is it to be right here right now to me? So if somebody goes and sells their business, and it could be for millions of dollars. I've seen people, they sell it for millions of dollars. And sometimes the more they've sell, sold their business for, the more frustrated and more upset they are with life. They mm -hmm. lose meaning. They lose purpose. They lose their drive. They lose their, their intentionality and their individuality. And it's sad to see if they're not asking themselves, what's the benefit to being here right now? So what's the benefit to having sold my business? One, I get a Schwack of money and get some capital gain. Great. Two, it could be assigned to me a proof that a proof of concept, that thing that I went after and everybody said, oh, you're crazy. That'll never work. It worked. It <laughs> worked in technicolor. Oh, that was awesome. Okay, great. And the fear can then become, well, yeah, but I don't know if that was just a fluke. I don't know if I came up with that. I don't know if it was just good timing. The world's changed. Am I going to get any more good ideas? You know, what's, what are the fears behind that? But what are the benefits to those fears? So if the fear is, I don't know if I'm going to get any other new ideas to be able to build another business for this, what's the benefit of that? Well, one, I'm forced to sit and bankroll all of my ideas and go, okay, can I come up with good ideas? Is this a one-off? Have I never had another good idea in my life? Well, Probably not. Uh, not that you haven't had another good idea, but it's probably not true that you've never had any, way too many negatives in that sense. Uh, but if you count them all, it was a neg <laughs> it's an odd number. <laughs> so it comes out to you have good ideas. And how do you capitalize on those ideas? So it might be, well, I actually come up with a lot of great ideas that I can't necessarily implement, but I now have the network and the Rolodex, if you will, to be able to find people who have resources, but they don't necessarily have good ideas. Mm -hmm. And then I can capitalize on that aspect of it. So it's it's this personal journey that we have to go through when we're stuck that I think is the fundamental importance and the opportunity that if we overlook it, we miss. And if we absorb it and, and delve into it, it can become the nirvana of spaces to be in. You know, our listeners range from uh, individual contributors to those who are managing others, to those who are managing large teams, to those who own companies, to those who manage divisions and beyond. For our conversation, I kind of want to stick to this business owner who has sold by all accounts. Wow. He or she has really hit it. They sold out. They hit it big. And they're all sort of looking around. Let's kind of get into the mind of a key individual in an organization. It might be the founder. It might be the leader. It's a key executive. As you're working with these individuals, what is it that you've learned in your years of working with them that do they think 
differently? And if so, how do you modify what you do with these people who are at that kind of level? Um, what have you found that might surprise some of our viewers or listeners? <laughs> when there is no real stereotype for it, there everybody has their own kind of space that they're in. And are there trends? Absolutely. So typically people that are running companies that have, let's say, divisions and they have a C-suite in there, they tend to have the ability to be able to see a big picture when nobody else can. Mm -hmm. But sometimes where they still get stuck is, okay, this has been going great and all of a sudden something happens that has never happened before. The stock market crashes, the market turns, the whatever, the the rules and regulations in that industry change. Something that is cataclysmic to the way that they do business, that is the thing that they're like, uh, like outside sources didn't usually um, present that big of an issue to them until this. And now they have to kind of restructure, how do I think about overcoming my external situations through my internal fortitude? And and being able to see opportunity and calamity. When when people can kind of hone in on those skill sets, then they have the ability to be able to get themselves unstuck, but they're it's not always as easily done as it is said. So even though they've kind of put that little Venn diagram together, they've dropped themselves like a little Google person right in the middle of that of that drawing and they're going, okay, so what are the opportunities? And sometimes they just they can't see the the forest for the trees right so they're they're looking at one their their executive team and going okay so has anybody ever been in a situation like this before no okay great that doesn't help us uh, has anybody ever <laughs> do you know anybody do you have some resources that we might be able to go through and it's they understand that they have a team of people that have different skill sets that are that are playing in the game, right? Your CIO has a very definite, different skill set than a CFO. One is looking at how do we minimize our our problems. The other one is looking at what opportunities are out there that we can that we can pin down. Your CMO is going, how do we be creative about this situation and let all of our past, you know, ignore that and kind of how do we step into the future? The job of the CEO is then to take this information and be able to see a vision. And the problem is if they can't, if they're stuck in that and they can't see forth is how do we start breaking through this? So sometimes we'll get into team meetings and just say, okay, no bad idea, no idea is a bad idea. If you said, hey, we could hire squirrels to take over the company right now, let's consider that a good idea and you know, move from there. And then what what ideas does that provoke? Then what ideas does that bring up? And then eventually kind of 10 steps in or 100 steps in comes the good ideas. So it's, I think the biggest difference with that level of individual is one, their willingness to look at this and go, okay, there's got to be a way through this over at across it. They kind of remind me a lot of um, pilots that were POWs, mm -hmm. right? You can have a lot of people in a war that are POW, prisoners of war. And they put them into little cattle brigades or in their little fenced areas. Most people will behave and try not to get shot, <laughs> except for pilots. <laughs> pilots are a special kind of crazy because they they are so much or they had been so much in the habit of resolving problems that other people saw as fatal. Right. Your, your plane is going down. You are <laughs> facing imminent death. And their job is to stay calm, relax, breathe, and see a way out of it in those 35 seconds that they have left. And typically entrepreneurs that have hired, have built a company from nothing, hired a whole team of people, they can see things, they can allow themselves to breathe even when their body is trying to shut down, going, no, nah, this is cataclysmic, make it stop. And believe it or not, when people sell their businesses, that it almost has the same stress load attached to it because they've got this influx of cash. Mm -hmm. But now, one, everybody wants it. Not all the ideas are good ideas. And who am I to 
to take on this whole new role. So I, I give you 27,000 ideas in there, but it's being able to understand that these people tend to, one, look internal to solve their problems. They have a willingness to solve their problems. They know they have resources that they can count on and and utilize them in a different sort of way. And it's just being able to kind of think in the eyes of <laughs> inevitable death to realize it's not really inevitable death. It just feels like it. You know, Michelle, when you said that, something that popped in my head, something I heard not long ago, and I may not have this right, but it goes something like this. They were comparing the stress levels in a military setting, in a wartime setting of infantry versus fighter pilots. And what I understand is the study showed that there was, um, you look at the the facts, the I'll use World War II, for example. I think the fatality rate was about 50% for fighter pilots. Or higher, yep. Yep, or higher. Mm-hmm. Much less for those you know, in an infantry role. But when they measured stress level, mm-hmm. a fighter pilot, though they had a 50-50 chance of not surviving, if you mm-hmm. would, typically had a much lower stress level than someone who was in infantry. Mm-hmm. And they basically attributed that to the, at least the fighter pilot felt that they were in some degree of control. Well, and and the irony to me is that they are they are not in any less control than anybody else in any other circumstance. They just think they are. <laughs> so it's a few things. One is they have this. I don't know if necessarily it's the training. It can be the training for sure. Certainly it is um, with today's modern pilots, they have to have breathing exercises. So you cannot get into a fighter jet without having breathing exercises or you just pass out. Like it's impossible to do nowadays. And that that breathing not only allows your heart to function, which is why they're doing it. They're, they're training their hearts to slow down, their lungs to increase capacity, but it also affects their brain which then allows their frontal cortex to be able to operate in their executive functions of the brain, where which is where your uh, creativity and idea solve, problem solving comes from. So it allows them to then think when other people aren't thinking. So if somebody's stressed out and they're not forcing themselves to breathe, which somebody running across a field, they're going to force themselves to breathe to the extent that they can continue running. But if they were a fighter pilot, they would actually be focused on their breathing and and stretching their lungs and their diaphragms in the moment while they're breathing, knowing that that is the thing that's going to keep them alive until they hit that next se- section of trees or whatever it is. The other thing is fighter pilots by nature tend to see danger as a source of excitement. And there really is no fundamental difference between the two, danger or excitement. We find excitement in danger. (laughs) Humans are a special kind of crazy in that other animals of the animal kingdom will scare each other and think it's funny. Humans will scare themselves in order to think it's funny. Mm. (laughs) So we come up with these crazy things like fighter jets and, and roller coasters and business and, you know, all these crazy things that create adrenaline rush for ourselves, that create that anticipation, that create that danger and the risk. And some of us seek it out, which you can learn how to see things that are scary or frightening or dangerous or create fear in you. And to see that as excitement, some of us just either naturally do it or we've been so conditioned in childhood that it's just the thing that we go after. You know, this conversation was obviously unscripted. But in terms of where we went with it, what uh, I what I am taking thus far is we're kind of going down the path of trying to understand things from the perspective of the person at the top. Mm-hmm. Uh, it may be people listening who are at the top, uh, or it may be that people are listening and they have aspirations at being at the top, but how they look at and how they uh, deal with matters uh, can vary. And I think you, you raised some really interesting comparisons. Um, and you brought up something that so often we tend to overlook. When people are wildly successful in financial terms, they might end up being miserable 
Um, and I'm really kind of intrigued. Um, as we start to kind of wind up our time together, Michelle, help me just kind of put this conversation in some form of perspective. We've opted to talk more about the perspective of the person at the top, but how would you begin to kind of wrap up this conversation in a way that would be almost described as takeaways? Well, I think the biggest thing to understand that if somebody is in a position of of authority, right? They've built their business up and it is it can be easy to see, yes, I was successful in this, but at the expense of what? I've lost my family, I've lost my kids, I've lost this. And they start to go through this grocery list of things that they've so-called lost in um in the pursuit of those goals, dreams, and aspirations. And it can be a dangerous position to be in, but it can also be an extremely powerful position to be in. So if you're finding yourself, well, as you're listening to this, going, yes, I have this success, but at what expense? To be able to look at one, the, the skills and experiences that you've learned outside of just the result thing. So regardless of how much money you sold the company for, regardless of how much time it took, regardless of those, what skills did you get? What experiences did you get that you wouldn't have got otherwise? And how can you use that to then move forward and create the the experiences and the lifestyle that you want to create from here on in? Because entrepreneurs have this overwhelming tendency to drop everything that's happened in the past and go, okay, now I'm starting from scratch again. And it's not true. Everything that we have created up until this point has got you to where you are. And it will continue to be a foundation to help you to move forward if you allow it to be. I mean, it will anyway. <laughs> if you can see it, then it becomes that much more powerful position. You're in a much more powerful position than you may think you are. And if you need help to be able to discover that, absolutely come and talk to Mike and or myself and figure that out because it's a dangerous position to think that you have no resources when you are loaded with them. Michelle, if folks want to come to you, what's the best way for them to reach out to you? Well, those of you that happen to be on YouTube can click on the QR code and get <laughs> registration for the event. Uh, I am on all social media. So if you figure out how to spell my name, Michelle Nedelec, um, I am the only one that speaks English out of the five of us on the planet right now. <laughs> and uh, uh, so an awarenessstrategies.com is always a good one. So michellenedelec.com, you'll find a whole array, which is very confusing, of who I am and all the things I bring to the table. And Awareness Strategies puts it into a nice little bow and says, this is what you need next. We're going to include that, obviously, in the show notes. Um, I anticipated a fun conversation and informative. Boy, you did get both. This has been, I've learned a great deal from you. Uh, for those who are not uh, looking, Michelle has a wonderful smile, uh, rose-colored glasses, and um, <laughs> You are just, you're kind to share your time with, with me and with us today. Thank you so much. Thank you for having me. I had a great time. Now, I've got a question for our listeners. Are people following you because they have to or because they want to? You know, as a leadership coach, I work with executives who have a track record of success behind them, but they're now, they're now feeling stuck. They're frustrated because they're finding that with each level of success that follows, the bar is set even higher. And they get discouraged because what worked in the past is no longer working. So my clients, despite all these successes in the past, are lacking the clarity and the competence to make the decisions needed to get to that next level. So if feeling stuck describes you or someone you know, let's talk. Go to bench-builders.com and just schedule a call. So I want to thank you again for joining us. And I hope you have picked up on some quick wins from Michelle. They'll help you get unstuck and on target. Thank you for joining us for this episode of Get Unstuck and On Target. I hope you've gained insights to help you lead with confidence and drive your organization forward. Remember at Bench Builders, we're committed to your success, your leadership excellence, and your strategic growth. If you've enjoyed our conversation today, please leave a review, rate, and subscribe to keep up with our latest episodes. 
This show really grows when listeners like you share it with others. Who do you know who needs to hear what we talked about today? Until next time, I encourage you to stay focused on the target and continue to break new ground on your leadership path.